And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Wendy Tam Cho, who's a professor of political science at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, who also holds appointments in statistics, Asian American studies, and the National Center for Supercomputing uh, Applications. Incredibly impressive. Uh, her, her background also includes study in applied mathematics and law. So with, Thank you. without further ado. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a, a computational approaches to redistricting, and I'm going to highlight a, a project that Yan Lu and I are, are actively working on, um, on redistricting. Um, the project we're working on is actually pretty broad. It has lots of different applications, including just drawing maps or to racial gerrymandering. Today I'm just going to talk about uh, partisan gerrymandering, because that's, that's the hot thing at the moment. Um, I can talk about the other stuff at some point, Q&A, or sometime when we're hanging out, or, or uh, later this afternoon, uh, Yan and I are doing one of the parallel sessions, and we'll spend two hours there talking uh, in a lot more detail about the algorithm, and we can talk about other stuff, too. So, um, gerrymandering, which needs no introduction, so I'm going to give it a very, very short one, is inherently suspicious, right? We see it, we hear about it, we think, that's suspicious. Uh, and it proceeds largely unimpeded by legal constraints. We've passed all sorts of laws over the years. You can't do this, you can't do that, you have to do this, you have to do that. And that prevents nothing, right? They keep on going, they get better at, at gerrymandering, we pass more laws, and we don't even know what laws to pass, right? Because there's so many ways to gerrymander, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't seem effective at all. At the same time, we notice that US elections are largely non-competitive. I like to do this all the time with uh, my students, I ask them, you know, every year, 435 members of Congress go up for re-election. Every year, every two years, they go up for re-election, all 435 of them. How many of them get re-elected? What percentage? And they throw out these things, and then I, I tell them, it's in the mid-90s. And they're like, really? But we don't like Congress. Like, exactly. <laughs> so why do we keep re-electing them? Uh, they sit in largely safe districts. So recently, this is the big case going for the, before the Supreme Court in October. Uh, Whitford v. Gill. So in this case, I think you guys all know this, Republicans won just about 49% of the vote but took 60% uh, percent of the seats. Then there's Pennsylvania, Republicans won just over half of the, the, the statewide vote and they have 72% of the congressional seats. North Carolina, they win just over half again of the statewide vote and have 77% of the congressional seats. So we hear this stuff and we think, is that not a gerrymander? Is that not a partisan gerrymander? How would we show uh, this? And why doesn't someone declare that? So partisan gerrymandering is unconstitutional. Uh, the Supreme Court, on the other hand, uh, has never declared an electoral map to be an unconstitutional partisan gerrymander. And the reason is, you guys have heard this this week, they don't know how to judge a partisan gerrymander. They don't know when you give them a map, they don't know how to look at it and say yes or no. They look at it and they say, I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, and since I can't really decide, I'm gonna say no for now. Uh, and this is where we're at. The Supreme Court's looking for a way to decide how uh, a map, or if, if a map is a partisan gerrymander or not. So uh, our idea is that a solution to this problem really sits at the intersection of a lot of disciplines. And Moon talked about this on the first day. I'm going to add some more disciplines. And actually, I left a couple out because I didn't like the symmetry of all those, the, the, an odd number of circles. <laughs> and I kind of like this picture. But for instance, statistics should be in there. Uh, and it, it's not. I didn't like it with seven circles. Looked better with six. Um, but uh, so our, our approach uses. Um, insights from all of these different disciplines. And Yan and I are both kind of eclectic and different and jack of all trades. And so we, we've actually, we have degrees or have published in, in all of these disciplines. So these are our favorite things. <laughs> and it, it all comes together for redistricting. So redistricting is an application of a graph partitioning problem. This is how we formulate it, which is basically a very hard problem. Um, the, the total number of maps you can draw is, is called the Sterling number of the second kind. There's actually uh, fewer maps once you, in, once you apply all the constraints, but unconstrained, it's, uh, there are an astronomical number of maps that can be drawn. So here, what we're looking at is if you have 55 units, like 55 precincts, say we have a lot more than that, 
um, but you, and you want to separate them into six districts, there's 10 to the 39th ways to uh, do that. And you're a numerate audience. You know that's a really, really large number. Um, that's an astronomically large number. So it's basically not, not possible. I'll give you a visual here. This is Minnesota. It has 87 counties, 1,000 uh, some census tracts, 4,000 some precincts, and 250,000 census blocks. And so what you're looking here at here are the, the census blocks. I know you can't see them because they're so small, but the idea here is you can partition at that level into eight congressional districts. Um, and you can see, even without my little sterling number uh, table, that, well, there's a lot of ways that that can be done. Pretty much anything you want can be done. Uh, here's uh, Pennsylvania. And this is 9,000 precincts into 19 congressional districts. The lines there are, are precinct lines. You can see those are also actually quite small. So the number of ways to do these things is, is, is astronomically large. And the computational complexity is formidable. So one of the things that we're talking about doing here is drawing maps uh, by computer versus by, by people. Um, so a computer can enumerate things, right? A lot of things. But here, there's so many things to do, and there's so many maps that can be drawn. But why do we want to draw maps anyway? Why do we want to draw alternative maps, right? You have a disputed map. They say, this is a partisan gerrymander. Is it odd? Is it? I don't know. Why do we want to draw more maps? So the reason is, no map can be understood in isolation. Right? I give you a map, I say, is it a partisan gerrymander? This is what the court gets. Is it a partisan gerrymander? Like the map? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> this is what they say. Uh, because maps can only be understood in context. Right? This one is a gerrymander. It's, it's a relative thing. Right? It is, it's not. Well, what does a gerrymander look like? Does this look like that? Does this look like this? So let me, let me go further and explain that to you. Let's take your favorite metric. I don't have a metric. Let's call it unfairness. I have an unfairness metric. Let's say I have one. Um, so I have a disputed map. I calculate my metric, unfairness. And my metric says its value is 5. Your unfairness value is 5. OK. My unfairness value is 5. What, what, what does that mean? You know, what, what is the baseline? How am I to judge this value of 5? Is that a, a gerrymander or not? Right? And this is what the court gets. They get your efficiency gap is this. Your this is that. This is that. And they, like, is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. So does five indicate unfairness? Well, it, it depends. Where are, where, what are my possibilities? If all the possibilities of all the maps that could be drawn are over here to the left, and, and this is, uh, these are the maps that can be drawn, and the map that is under dispute is, is an outlier. It's basically this really weird map. It's a lot more unfair than the maps that could be drawn. Then you might say, hey, that five number? I think that's pretty bad, that five, right? On the other hand, if you draw all the maps and you say, OK, this is where all the maps are drawn, and this is their measure of unfairness, the other maps, and five is somewhere smack in the middle, then you're like, five? Five is OK, right? It's not five that matters. It's where all the other maps are for, that could have been drawn. This is what the Supreme Court gets. Is five OK? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I need, I need some way to judge that. I need to know what else could have been done. Did they have the other opportunities and then they did this or, or what? And the, the comparison here, I want to make a point of this, is when we're drawing these other maps, we're talking about other maps that could have been drawn for this state. So sometimes you hear people talk about the efficiency gap, and they'll say, well, the one in California was you know, 0.1, and this one is 0.8. It's like, but that's California. You can't compare California to, say, Montana. They are different states. They have different geography. They have different everything. They have different people, right? Um, and so what could have been done in one state is not the same as what could have been done in another state. What you have to compare is what could have been done in your state. How could your state have been redistricted differently? Not can your state have been California. Your state could not have been California. Your state could not have been some other state. Your state can only be your state. And so we end up with one map going before the Supreme Court and nothing else, right? 
or possibly they'll get another map. Some expert will come in and say, hey, I got another map for you. This map is better. So they'll say, hey, look, I got another map. It's over here. Does that make this one bad? I don't know, because someone else can come on a map. I have a map. It's over here. Like, okay, I don't need one map. I don't need two maps. I need to know what could have been done, right? So that's what we're trying to, to do. So a lot of people, this is actually not my idea. It's a really old idea. Uh, people have been trying to do this since the 60s. They said, let's draw all the maps that were possible. And if we can do that, then we can say, hey, this map uh, is unfair. Because look at all the ones that could have been done. This one is, is so far out, out of the mainstream. So the problem with this is, again, it's really, really hard to enumerate all the maps that could have been drawn. In fact, it's, it's impossible within our uh, current computing environment. So they tried to do this, because it's a good idea, uh, but it was successful for only very small problems, right? That it was only, they could only compute it for toy redistricting problems. So then uh, people started doing this random sampling or, or simulations. So they said, if I, we can't draw all the maps, I can draw a random sample of maps. And if I can draw a random sample, then I can get an idea of what the whole thing looks like without drawing the whole thing. So a lot of people have been doing that. Um, and the question there is, is the sample large enough? Is it, is it random? Is it independent? Because there we have to satisfy all the statistical properties that we need in a sample, which is not easy. Um, another approach has been this optimization where people have written um, algorithms to search for uh, good maps or optimal maps. And that's a different thing uh, also. Um, the, I'll point on here because I don't have a laser pointer. But the, the most recent thing here, which I'll talk about next, is these guys uh, have all been working on an approach called MCMC, Markov Chain Monte Carlo. This has been the, the, um, the latest work, I guess. So I'm going to talk about that for a little bit. Uh, but the goal I'll talk about first is what do we want? We want a very large sample of high quality independent maps. Right, that's that distribution I'm showing you. I want this distribution and I want it to be a very large random sample of high quality maps. There's no free lunch here. This is not an easy problem. It's not easy to do, it's not easy to compute, it's, not, it's just not easy and there's no easy way to do it. So when I say very large, I'm not talking about a thousand. I showed you, if you only have a thousand maps and there's an astronomical number of maps that could have been done, a thousand is not gonna characterize uh, properly what could have been done. So we're talking billions, more than billions of maps uh, to satisfy the statistical theory that would justify this approach. So when I say high quality, I'm talking about maps, not just like a computer drawn map, computer drew a map, it's like okay, uh, would a human think that's a good map? Because if a human doesn't think that's a good map, we're not interested in that map. Right, because that map could never have been enacted into law. These have to be maps that are drawn that could have been enacted into law. So they have to be maps that satisfy all the legal constraints, all the things that the Supreme Court has said they want done in a map, and something that a human would actually draw. Uh, the maps have to be independent, meaning each one supplies new information. So you can see, like if I move one census block, the map really hasn't changed. <laughs> Right? It's changed in a minuscule way. That's not an independent map of, the, of, of another map. You have to have independent maps that, are, that supply new information. And you need a, a, a random sample. So this is our goal. So I'll talk about MCMC. Um, MCMC is intended to draw uh, samples, random samples, from basically a distribution that you, you don't know what the distribution is, but you want to draw a random sample of it. Um, and the way you do that is you use a Markov chain, and you use Markov chain, you run it for a long time, and the Markov chain creates this, this distribution for you. This is the theory of MCMC, which is fantastic because that's exactly what we want. So the, the, the theory animating MCMC is exactly what we are looking for here. Um, but the problem size of the redistricting problem is astronomical. I keep coming back to that. It's astronomical. Uh, and MCMC is not a magic bullet here, so let me explain why. Um, so all the current implementations of MCMC simplify the problem to make it computationally tractable. So let me explain that to you from their work. So this is the work of uh, a team at Duke. They implemented an MCMC. They ran it on North Carolina. 
and this is from their paper. So they say they randomly sample reasonable redistrictings, which are near these three redistrictings, uh, in the sense that no single district differs by more VTDs than a set threshold from the redistricting under study, 10%. Uh, so what they're doing is they're not sampling all the possible maps. They're taking the, the, a map, a certain map, and then they're saying, I'm not gonna change this map by more than 10%, and I'm only gonna look at maps that are less than 10% different from this current map, right? So then they, the, the next quote is more or less the same thing. So the idea here is the problem is astronomically large, and they're like, well, I can't do that. But what I can do is if you give me a current map, I won't change that too much, and I'll see how that changes um, what that distribution of maps looks like, which is a different problem. So this is from another paper, also from the Duke team, um, an earlier paper, but they say the same thing. So they're talking about the space of redistricting is enormous. It's what I've been telling you. So they are in reality only sampling from a region around the initial condition. So that they have a disputed map and they say, I'm not gonna change that map too much, I'm gonna look around this map. I'm gonna see what, what else could have been done that was different, but I'm not gonna change what, what was done too much. Okay, there's another paper by these guys. Uh, at Princeton, and so they're also doing an MCMC, a different implementation of it, um, but the same idea. So they also say that they're not exploring the entire space of valid redistricting plans. They conduct a local simulation, and they don't change it by more than 5%. So the last quote, you'll see that even when they're only changing the current plan by 5%, they ran this thing for 72 hours and they got 200 draws on three cores. So this suggests, I think it more than suggests, that the, the standard algorithms are not going to work. Uh, you're not changing the map very much. You're running the thing for 72 hours. You get 200 alternative maps. 200, that's really far from my billions and billions that I was saying that we want. Uh, so we can either run a few more hours uh, before we get what we want. So, I want to talk about this idea because both of those papers say that uh, examining local redistrictings is fine because this is a traditional districting principle. So they say protecting incumbents and preserving district cores, that's part of what the Supreme Court says we should be doing uh, when we draw maps. Okay, this is true. It is a traditional districting principle. Um, and the reason is that if you draw a map, and you take all the incumbents in a state and you draw them into the same district, that's very disruptive to the political process. The court doesn't like it when you do that, right? It's not that they like the incumbents so much and they want to protect their seats, it's because they don't want to disrupt the process because that's bad for, for democracy, right? It's, it's just bad to have no continuity, conti, continuity there. Um, and the same thing for the inner uh, core of the district. So, that the Supreme Court doesn't say anything about 5% or 10% or anything like that, but they don't like it if you just you know, flip everything over and then everybody's confused, because you know, the electorate's easily confused. They don't want them to confuse, confuse too much, so they, they like it. They, the Supreme Court has talked about this, that uh, that is a traditional districting principle. So if you're gonna rank the traditional districting principles, I don't know, we don't really rank them, but these are uh, the Supreme Court's least favorite, in my opinion. They talk all the time about preserving towns, communities of interest, political boundaries. They, they have mentioned these, but they don't really talk about it that much. And if you ask them, do we want to protect incumbents? They're like, no, not like that. It's for the people, not for the, for the incumbents. Um, and so this idea that you should be doing your simulations to be local redistrictings, I don't think really works with the legal theory that the Supreme Court has put forth. Um, and if you think about it, Philosophically, it doesn't make sense, right? If the current map is arguably a gerrymander, which is why it's going before the Supreme Court, does it make sense that the court wants the core of that preserved? It's like, okay, this might be a gerrymander. So let's look at that, uh, you know, our, our favorite North Carolina with the 12th there, the one that was really ugly. Does the court really want that preserved? I don't think so. It doesn't really make sense that that is what they're asking for. And if you sample maps based on a disputed map, uh, mathematically, that doesn't make sense either.
because it produces uh, the wrong comparison set. So let me give you a, a, an example. So let's say we, we computed, so the red, red line is, say, the disputed map, and we did a local redistricting. And we noticed that uh, the red, the, the, the map under dispute, oh, it's, it's kind of an outlier, right? We could have done better in a local redistricting. If we moved around that map, we did an MCMC, we could have done better. So you might say then, hey, that's evidence of a gerrymander, right? This is what I'm talking about. You, you find something, it's an outlier, there's all these things around it that could have been better. That's an, that's an outlier, that's an argument for a gerrymander. However, let's say this is the, the space of all redistrictings that could have been done. Then you say, oh, actually, five, five is not bad, right? Five is bad in a, in a local sense, but on the grand scheme of things, that's not a gerrymander, and the court would see it that way, right? The court wouldn't say, hey, in the local redistricting, it's bad. Um, they, won't, they don't want to know about a local redistricting. They want to know what was possible and how well did you do in comparison to what's possible. Um, I've been trying to ex figure out how to explain this. So yesterday I came up with an analogy I thought was pretty good while I was trying to explain it to someone, so I'll repeat it to you. <laughs> it's basically like, um, so the other person was saying to me, let's say I'm, I'm, I don't have very much, like I have the worst house on the block or, or in, the, or in the, you know, some area, right? And every house around me is much better than mine. Doesn't that mean that I don't have a very good house? That's a local redistricting. So you could say, yeah, so you don't have a very good house. So the analogy I would draw there is to say, okay, so you're an American, you don't have a very good house. Let's go to a third world country you have a very good house, right? Poverty, it's, you can define it locally. You can say, this is, I'm poor because the people around me are poor. Or you can say, you can look more globally and say, this is how we should define poverty. And this is what I'm saying about redistricting, is it's not about, could there have been a better redistricting right around where you are? It's, if I look at the space of redistricting that could have been done, how does this fall in that space? All right, so examining local redistricting, so which is what all the MCMC implementations do, um, makes the problem computationally simpler because they have to do a lot less computing, but it's really addressing a very different question. And that different question has an unknown relationship with the true underlying problem. So here's another uh, team that is working on what we call random districts which I put in quotes for a reason I won't explain here, but if you catch me later, I'll explain it to you ad nauseum. Uh, but what they do here is they're trying to say, okay, let's draw random districts and let's preserve the traditional districting principles where we want to preserve counties or preserve cities. And so one of the things they did uh, in Florida was they said, okay, I'm going to draw you random maps and here uh, the uh, that there are certain counties that were preserved in the disputed plan. I'm going to preserve those exact same counties. And then the other ones I'll, I'll allow to be split. But the ones that were held constant or held um, together in the disputed plan, I will also hold together. And they said that did the same for cities, and then they did the same for certain counties. Uh, that is not what the Supreme Court means when they say you're preserving, you're trying to preserve towns and cities. They want you to preserve towns and cities when you draw plans. If there's a disputed plan, you don't hold the exact same ones constant. You're, you're biasing what you're doing by doing that because this is a disputed plan, right? It's the same idea as you're bringing bias into your, your simulations. So again, they've, they've redefined uh, to a different problem. And the reason this is done is that's a lot more computationally tractable. It's a lot easier to do that than to do what the Supreme Court really is talking about. And when the Supreme Court sees that, in my opinion, they know that this is not what they're talking about. All right, so if you simplify the problem for computational convenience, that's not a solution. And that's problematic from a legal uh, vantage point. So I'm talking about MCMC again really quickly here. So MCMC is animated by this theorem, which I'm not going to read to you. You can read it yourself. But basically, this is a theorem. It's been proven. It's true. It works. 
The theory that animates MCMC, it works. On the other hand, just because the theory works, it doesn't mean it's going to work in your lifetime. The amount of computation to make it work is not feasible. So the theorem works, but we don't have any idea how, how to compose this Markov chain. We don't have any idea how long we have to let this thing run. Uh, for sure, we have to let it run a really, 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 really long time. Um, and we have no idea about our estimate um, then afterwards. So we need to formulate a random walk for an MCMC. And if you, you incorporate all the redistricting constraints, it's absolutely unclear how you would formulate that random walk. Uh, one of the things you can do is, you know, you random walk and you discard solutions that don't satisfy your constraints. That doesn't work for the theory of MCMC. So the thing I want to, to bring home about this stuff is there are two things you have to do here. One, you need an algorithm to identify these high quality maps, right? You need some way for a computer to do this. You need an algorithm uh, to do that. But even after you have the algorithm, which is not simple, you have to then attack this, this computational issue. You can design the algorithm, but even after you have an algorithm to identify maps, you have to compute a lot of them. So it has to be an extremely efficient uh, process. So uh, this project that uh, Yan and I have been working on, or are working on actively, is, uh, is called PAIR. It's a parallel evolutionary algorithm for redistricting. And the, the thing that animates our work is this idea that the scope of the search needs to be the realm of possibility. You have to look at what was possible, and, what, and then you can compare the map in question to the, what was possible. So MCMC implementations limit the scope of maps for computational tractability. And I'll, I'll give you a, what I think is a, a simple explanation of why. So they, they formulate it as a graph cut problem. So basically here you have uh, nodes, and the nodes are, say, precincts. And then the edges show where the precincts are connected. And then you, you basically cut the graph at a certain point to create districts. So the idea here for a random walk is you have to know how to then cut it differently to get to another legally valid redistricting. And that, that's not clear because you're supposed to be trying to keep cities together. You're supposed to be keeping population equality. You're supposed to keep it contiguous. You're supposed to have it compact. So how you actually move these lines to achieve all of those things within this, this setup is, is unclear. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, you don't have a random walk. If you don't have a random walk, you're going to run into a lot of trouble getting your MCMC to do what you want. Okay. So our optimization framework is, is quite different. Um, but, uh, and we'll talk about this in detail this afternoon if you want to hear about it. But we're able to, in our framework, integrate all of the legal constraints. And we, have, we, we do not have to restrict to local redistrictings. We're searching the entire space. So our algorithm is, is a massively parallel implementation of an evolutionary algorithm. It's designed to be run in a high performance computing environment. And part of our uh, research interest in this is our work on Blue Waters, which is at the University of Illinois. Uh, that's a picture of Blue Waters. It's the fastest research supercomputer in the world. It has uh, more than 700,000 processor cores, and it runs at a sustained quadrillion calculations per, sec per second. Um, so it's, it's really fast. It runs about 13 million times faster than your average laptop. It does a lot of computing really fast. <laughs> and what we need here is, is a, lot of, a lot of computing. So this is, uh, this is part of our, our work on this project, is not just the algorithm, but also how you would, how you would utilize uh, massively parallel uh, architecture to, to speed up the problem. So um, we have scaled up to run on over 131,000 processor cores. So another thing that's different about what we're doing is that uh, we don't need to define this random walk. We achieve our randomness by having a unique uh, random sequence on every processor. So every processor actually is an independent uh, process. And so we, we get independence that way. We don't have to figure out how to get independence. We can get independence by uh, having the different processors run independently. 
Uh, these next few slides I am going to just fly through because they are our slides for, for this afternoon. But I'll give you a preview and then you can decide if you want to come or not. But uh, I'm not going to explain them in any detail now. Uh, I'm going to skip that one actually. I'm going to skip that one. So <laughs> <laughs> now you want to come. <laughs> Uh, so there's a base evolutionary algorithm which runs on uh, one processor. This is, the, this is the base algorithm. It runs on every processor, but this is just the algorithm, uh, the base algorithm. So uh, we'll kind of run through it on, on our maps. We have, we build adjacency structures, and I'll talk about how we actually build our, our seed maps. Um, these are our basic um, operators for our evolutionary algorithm. We'll talk through those. I'll draw you a picture, tell you how the picture works. This is a second uh, operator for, for a crossover. Uh, if you don't not familiar with evolutionary algorithms, we'll go through that, the basic idea of them and how they work. Um, show you pictures, <laughs> talk through it. Uh, we'll, do an we'll show you an algorithm performance uh, study that we did. So this is a uh, pair against a couple of other algorithms that are, are basically trying to do the same thing. So if you don't want to really come this afternoon, the short story is we're a lot faster. <laughs> uh, and that, that actually is only running on one processor. That isn't us on a supercomputer and them on a laptop. That's us both just running uh, on the same architecture. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk through uh, a little bit about supercomputing and our work there. So some of the things we'll cover is this is our our basic communication structure for our processors. We'll talk about communication costs, how we cut that way down to get uh, the, the, the algorithm to run fast and efficiently. Uh, this is how the, the solutions that we can find quickly and uh, with more processors. So utilizing lots of processors efficiently. Uh, we'll talk about how we have the different processors communicate with each other. Um, but the basic idea with uh, supercomputing, which I, I will talk about briefly now, is that it's the, the idea with the supercomputer is that you have, so on, on Blue Waters, we have 700,000-ish processors, right? So if you have one processor, one processor does one thing, right? You, you give it a set of instructions, it executes a set of instructions. So uh, I've done this analogy before. I don't know if it really works, but you can tell me later. Let's say you're building a house. So if one person builds a house, one person says, okay, I do all this stuff. I put in the nails, I put up the drywall, I do the plumbing. You know, one person goes, one person knows this is all the stuff that needs to be done, right? So if 10 people build a house, then you're like, okay, that could be better if the 10 people communicate and coordinate, right? If they don't, and the 10 people are running over each other, I was doing the nails, I was doing the, what are you doing? Wait, are we supposed to talk about this? Then it can be chaos, right? If you have 10 people trying to do uh, one task, you have to communicate and coordinate. So maybe you figure out 10 people, if you have 100,000 people building the house, you see the problem, right? <laughs> if there isn't communication and coordination, if you do that right, it goes really, really fast. If you do it wrong, it just doesn't work, right? So same idea with uh, a supercomputer. On a supercomputer, we basically have lots of processors working together to, for a problem. And so they have to communicate with each other, and they have to um, basically work together to get the problem done. And that, that piece of it is a, is a separate piece from the algorithm itself, which is how to find a map. Then it's about how to make hundreds of thousands of, of processors work together to make that process faster. It's actually not always faster when you use more processors, just like it's not always faster if you have 100,000 people to send on a, on a house building site. Uh, there, there's a way to do it, and there are ways not to do it. Um, so that, that's the supercomputing aspect of it. Uh, so what can we do with a very large number of independent, feasible, high-quality maps? Uh, this this is, a, is a video that Vox did. And I'm going to run the video, just a short clip of it, to give you an idea of, of what we're doing, because it actually explains it better than I explained it. These are our maps that I supplied to Vox. We gave them um, thousands of maps, and they made this video for us. So the idea behind all the maps is, in the video, it's really cool because they flash them on the screen, and then they change them around, and the colors move. Uh, <laughs> just imagine that going on. <laughs> uh, 
And so basically what's happening is we, we, rifle, we draw these maps and we draw billions of them, right? And we rifle through them and we compute different uh, partisan metrics. So here we, you, can do, you can compute whatever metrics you want, but we did responsiveness bias competitiveness. We also did the efficiency gap and a couple other things we, we, we uh, coded up. Um, but basically what our algorithm does is you can, it's an algorithm. Right? It's, not a, it's not a human. When a human draws a map, you're thinking, what is that human thinking? I don't know, because it's, it's human, right? But when a computer draws a map, you know, I, I say this all the time, a computer is, is better than your dog, right? It does everything you want and only that. It's like nothing else. It, it just does exactly what you want uh, and you know what, what it's doing. Uh, so here in our algorithm, we have coded up all the, the, the uh, criteria that the Supreme Court wants uh, implemented in, in map drawing. Compactness, population equality, contiguity. Uh, we have partisan metrics coded up. We tell the, the, the computer you, you're supposed to preserve counties and cities and you know, all this other stuff. So we have everything coded up. Um, and then when, when it draws maps, we give it a weighting algorithm. So we basically say, when you're trying to decide where to move your next thing to get your next map, this is how you should weight it. So if it breaks off a uh, population, this is what you should do. If, it, if it's breaking up, breaking up a city, then you, know, you should weight your move this way or that way. Um, so we weight everything. And so one of the things we can do is draw without any partisan uh, information at all. We can just turn that off, right? It's just not, it's just not part of the map drawing. So we, we can turn it off and then we, we can draw all these maps, a billion of them, and then we can create those histograms and say, look, I drew a billion maps and I didn't use partisan information at all. And this is what happens when you don't use partisan information. You, you get these kinds of maps, right? And then we can also take the algorithm then after we've created those and we can say, now I'm gonna turn partisanship on. And you can turn it on at any level. You can make it 10% of the, the decision process. You can make it 100% of the decision process. It's a computer, right? You just tell it, this is your decision making rule. It can be 50% of your decision-making process, whatever you want, it's a computer. Uh, and then we can draw another billion maps or whatever. And you can say, and look, this is what maps look like when, you, when you're using partisan information, when that's part of your decision-making process, right? And then we can create, again, these histograms that I've been showing you, and you can say, hey, look, your disputed map, it looks like these ones that use partisanship. It doesn't look like the ones that didn't use partisanship, right? In, in that way, you've given someone a tool to say, hey, I think actually, even though I can't read your mind, I basically backtracked your mind, right? This is the process. This, this is the process that would create a map like you drew. So the video that doesn't work and, uh, well, that doesn't look good either. Okay. so. Um, I think yesterday uh, there was a talk on partisan metrics. So this is from the seats votes curve, which I'm not going to explain to you, but uh, oops, go back. So the idea here is we create all these maps. That's the histogram that doesn't look very good. I'm not sure why, but you, you get the idea. And then you can, you can place these other maps. So these are the maps, this was North Carolina. The red one is the current map uh, and the green one was their map from the decade previous. So this is bias, which also doesn't look very good, but uh, the 2001 plan looked like it wasn't so biased and then the one they drew later seemed a lot more biased and the, 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 the plans that we drew are in that histogram. Uh, th these were the nonpartisan maps that we drew. So again, we can draw any kind of maps. Uh, same idea here, this is competitiveness and those are the, the current and the, the previous plans. So the, the idea here is we're drawing plans and we're trying to figure out basically what the Supreme Court wa wants to call intent, right? Because if you put somebody on the stand and you say, did you intend to do this? <laughs> no. <laughs> they, they always say no, right? <laughs> so you go back and you say, well, let's see. I'm going to create this decision-making process and see what kind of maps evolved. Now I'm going to create this other decision process that, that uses partisanship, and I, now I want to see what kind of plans evolve. And I want to see, does your plan look like 
Does it look like what? What decision-making process did you ostensibly use? And the Supreme Court says um, that you can use partisanship uh, when you draw maps. You just can't use it excessively. So I don't know where the Supreme Court wants to put excessive, but you know, for me, it's just a number. What do you want? 75, 50? I can do you know, whatever you want. Uh, and then I can make these plots, and then you can decide. You know, this is just a tool. The, the decision of whether or not it's unconstitutional would be to the court. So the court would say, you know, how far outside of this histogram would you have to be to be unconstitutional? That, that's a legal decision for the court to make. This is just a tool. So uh, I'm almost done here, but the thing that has, has animated our work is this idea that the power of information, this is, people talk about this all the time, right? How the power of information is changing society. It has changed society in amazing ways. It hasn't really changed social science in amazing ways. Social science hasn't quite figured it out, but uh, this ability we now have to compile and synthesize and analyze massive amounts of information, we can use that not only for your GPS to get you, you know, a good rec restaurant recommendation or whatever, we can use it to improve society. And that's one of the things that uh, we're trying to do with, with our project is to improve our democratic society and how we actually have, how we govern ourselves with more information and more computing. I think that's my time, right? Thank you, Professor. Uh, how can we justify one way of sampling from another? That is, what legal and political principles could we use to argue for a specific distribution in the set of maps, ignoring for a second whether or not that would be easy to explain in court? Uh, there isn't really ways of sampling. There's only, there's only one statistical valid way of sampling. You draw an independent uh, random sample. That's not my idea. It's, that's statistics. I'm not sure if that was the question. <laughs> okay. um, so. uh, well, MCMC, as I think I said, it works in theory. In theory, it works. But computationally, it's infeasible. Uh, the way they've defined it, you, you, don't know how to, you don't know how to define that random walk. Uh, if you don't define the random walk right, MCMC theory breaks down. If someone could figure that out, it would work. The theory works. It's just computationally uh, infeasible the way, it, way it's done. Uh, and to me, it's not clear how to fix that. But maybe somebody else will figure out how you actually can fix that. Um, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court rejected a legislative reappointment map last census on the basis of a comparison to a single drawn map. Uh, the plaintiff prevailed by comparing the number of municipalities split. Is there a possibility of using your techniques to find and use better maps even without sampling the full redistricting space? Uh, theoretically, this is the only way that I think is, is a valid way of doing it. If you create a map, Anyone can create a map. And I think the Supreme Court has routinely rejected this idea that if just because there is a better map doesn't mean this one is unconstitutional, right? It's not there is a better map. It's, it's what could have been done and did you use partisanship excessively? Just because there's a better map doesn't mean you use partisanship excessively, right? They're, those are different uh, questions. How strictly do you apply criteria like compactness when generating your high quality maps? That is completely up to the, the user. You can say compactness is everything. You can say, you know, it's 90% of the decision-making process. You can say it's 50%. Everything is, is malleable, right? Everything, you just decide, and then the maps are created. I, ha I have no agenda here. I'm only interested in tool creation. <laughs> Do the maps you generate address the Voting Rights Act concerns in North Carolina, for example? Does it say that again? The, the Voting Rights Act concerns in North Carolina. Yeah, so uh, the, everything I talked about here as far as application is to, to partisan gerrymandering. Racial gerrymandering has a different set of case law. It has different uh, requirements for what the Supreme Court is looking for in order to not be a, a racial gerrymander. Uh, we are working on that. We don't have that, we don't have that done. 
uh, that would be that would require coding up different things, and we just don't we don't have it done. But can be done, and can be done within our framework um, once we find the time to do it. Would you advocate for a fully algorithmic redistricting process? Would you remove humans from the process entirely? Uh, I would never do that. <laughs> uh, my ideal way of doing this, not that anybody cares, but my <laughs> ideal way of doing this would be to have a computer draw maps uh, for humans to decide, you know, this is what we want the computer to produce, and then have the computer produce that. And then the humans would then take those maps and there would be, there'd be a bargaining process, right? You talk, the, the different stakeholders, minorities, Democrats, Republicans, whoever, there's lots of different stakeholders here, would, could come up and say, well, I would like a map that at least does this. I would like a map that at least does that. And we say, can we find a map that at least does these things? Can we tweak this this way? Can we tweak this that way? And the humans would then finally decide, this is the map that we can agree on. So it, it's much like what the legislature does now with laws where they have to, they have to bargain you know, with the different people. But what this applies is information to different stakeholders. Because right now, people don't know. They don't know what's possible. They don't know how to protect their interests. They don't know what map is best for them. They don't know how that map interacts with other interests. They just don't know. And so there's no ability to bargain. There's no ability for different interest groups to even enter that, um, that conversation. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is create a tool that lets more people more interested stakeholders enter the process in an informed way. How close is PEAR to sam sampling randomly from the distribution? I have no idea, actually. That's a theoretical argument that we have not quite worked out yet. Uh, it requires a lot, a lot of maps. And uh, the exact number, I have not worked out. But we're not there yet. How did you code up all the metrics that the Supreme Court wants when they haven't made clear what those metrics are? Uh, first, we, we haven't coded up everything. So for instance, we only have one measure of compactness. I wouldn't say it's the measure. There is no the measure. The Supreme Court doesn't have a measure. They like things to be compact. They don't give you a definition. Uh, one of the things we want to do uh, this coming year, for instance, is to code up a lot more criterion you know, for compactness for partisan uh, unfairness. Because we actually don't know if these things are measuring the thing that we want. So one of the papers we wrote um, for the William and Mary Law Review just earlier this year was taking our algorithm and exploring different partisan metrics and saying, well, the efficiency gap, is that basically uh, proportional representation? Let's see, if I optimize proportional representation, do I get good efficiency gap measures? Or is it different stuff? If I optimize on responsiveness, what does that do to the efficiency gap? Are those the same thing? Are they different things? And so one of the things that we, we're trying to do with that is just understand how the different metrics work. So again, I have no agenda here. If you have a, a criterion, if the Supreme Court has a criterion, we, we can code it up and we can say, this is what you get. Uh, I'm not trying to push a metric or a set of metrics. Um, I'm only interested in tool development. <laughs> What's the dollar cost of 10 to the 9th maps on Blue Waters? What's the dollar cost? Um, I don't actually know. So the way Blue Waters works is uh, it's open to the, the public for research. So if you want to use Blue Waters, you, you write a grant just like you would write an NSF grant. You say, this is my project. This is how many NOAA hours I need. This is what's required in my project. And you write up basically a, a, a grant proposal. And then they grant you some number of node hours. So uh, this year, I think we have a little over 6 million node hours uh, to, to work on redistricting. So it, it costs us nothing except the time to write the, the grant proposal. I think you can actually pay, um, but I don't know. <laughs> Why do we need billions of maps? Statistically, doesn't the randomness of the sample matter, not the size of the population? Uh, both things matter. So let's say, for, for example, you, you want to sample the entire United States, which we do all the time. We, we, we create surveys. So if you create a survey, you want a survey of the entire United States and you sample two people randomly, you can sample two people randomly. But you know what? It's not going to tell you that much. Uh, it's not that it wasn't random. It's not that it wasn't independent. You just, just only got two people. <laughs> And you can only capture so much in two people. Uh, if, you, if you take 1,000 people, you can pick up a lot more. It's, it's, it's also related to size. It's not just the, uh, the independence or the randomness. 
We've heard repeatedly that the courts don't want to look at the districting of a whole state, but rather by considering a district individually. What do you think is the best way to convince the court to take a broader approach to fairness? Uh, a broader approach meaning you have to redistrict the entire state? Because districts actually, they don't sit in isolation. If you change one, you change another one, right? You can't just change a district. It's, you only got so many things to move around. Yes. <laughs> Can these maps be produced using distributed supercomputing as we do to find Mersenne primes? You know, there's actually a lot of different ways to do this. This just happens to be the way we do it. Uh, if you can harness massive computing power in another way, you do it. <laughs> this is just happens to be what, uh, what we're doing. Will we ever have a non-supercomputer version so people could do this on their own? How far away or difficult would that be? Okay, so uh, someone thinks I know a lot more than I do. I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> Uh, but I will say, redistricting is a problem that I've been working on. Um, I wrote my first paper on this as an undergraduate, and that was 30 years ago. And I actually did, I wrote code for it. And I can tell you 30 years ago, I was not coding on Blue Waters. And what I was doing, it wasn't going very fast, and it didn't really work. And actually, 30 years ago, if you had told me, 30 years from now, you will be running it on a computer like this, I was like, really? That's cool. <laughs> Uh, and 30 years from now, I mean, you just think about it. I, I know a lot of you can think back 30 years and what computing was 30 years ago. And to think that this is what computing is now, and that's what computing was 30 years. 30 years ago, remember? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> and 30 years from now, you know, your phone is way better than what I was computing on 30 years ago. Right? It, it just is. It's, it has so much more memory, it's so much faster. This is your phone. I was on servers 30 years ago, right? And it's just no comparison. So 30 years from now, I have no idea where we'll be, but we're not gonna be here. I mean, this is only improving. To say that, oh, this is where we're at and it's never gonna get any better, that's ludicrous. It's getting better every day. Every day this is more and more possible. Every day this becomes uh, a reality. And if you want to talk about the future, the future of redistricting and what can be done, this is the way, because this, this is improving all the time. Every day it gets faster and more accessible. So, if a redistricting plan is an outlier in the local redistricting space, isn't that enough to claim that the districts have been intentionally constructed to create a gerrymander, even if the plan is not extreme in the full redistricting space? Uh, I would say no, because that's a bias sample. So anyone can construct a bias sample and say, look, in my bias sample, you're an outlier. The point is not what are you in my bias sample, the point is what are you in the, the correct sample. One more question. There's a black box aspect to your algorithm. How can we make sure that it's used fairly in court? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, this is a big debate right now in, in, uh, in AI, right? People write these algorithms and you're like, okay, it's doing something and I don't know. It's not just me. I'm not the only black box. <laughs> we wrote an algorithm. Uh, we'll put it out there at some point. People can look at it and decide. I don't know how many people are gonna look at it and, and decide. But uh, this, is, this, is, this is a huge issue going forward with computing is that people are writing these things and people make decisions based on these algorithms. And we actually need to have some way to uh, as the word is not police, but some way to, to regulate that kind of uh, thing. This is, this is a problem for the future. Um, I guess it's a problem for me too, but it's, a, it's not my problem per se. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a uh, good person, it worked, <laughs> that's what I said. Sorry, just one more question. Is your project open source for others to tinker with? Uh, it is not open source, it's under active development right now, so we're, at, at some point it will be open source, but uh, it is not currently. Right. Thank you so much, Professor. Yeah.